I also want to thank um, DSA for sponsoring this event, as well as the Knight Foundation and New York Public Humanities. We wouldn't be able to get everyone together and produce these videos without them. Um, also a shout out to Yum Village and Godwin at Yum Village for giving us the opportunity to record this video and the video for next week at his space. So I'm going to mute myself and we're going to video. Let me uh, let us know in the chat if you can't hear anything, and we can we can work the, on that. Cool. All right, here we go. Peace, everyone. My name is Magan Sawande Keita, officially known as Baba Sawande Keita. So I'm going to talk briefly about myself. My name is Sawande Alayo Keita, and I play the djembe. I was introduced to the djembe by my late father and my mother. My father's name is Keen Sunyata Keita. My mother's name is Kahimba Keita. And they taught me a plethora of things about the djembe the dance, and the culture of Mali, the culture of Senegal, the culture of Guinea. So today I'm here to at least tell you some things about that I've learned on my journey in playing djembe the last 35 years. So um, let's start off with what are the drums? Let's start there. So this is a djembe. The djembe comes from Mali, but it's an instrument that's shared in different parts of West Africa. So predominantly when we think of djembe, we should think of Mali and pay homage to it. Mali and the Mali Empire and the epic of Sunjata and there's so many wonderful kingdoms that would come out of that era. But then the instrument was shared in Senegal, it was shared in Guinea, it was shared in Sierra Leone, and even brought all the way here to Detroit and plenty of other major cities in America and probably throughout the world, respectfully, that the djembe is shared and honored and revered. So as we transition from the mother drum or the djembe, we have the father drum, which is the dundumba, the somba, and the kinkini. So a lot of times in the music, the somba is the leader in most instances. And then the dundumba and the kinkini help to support the somba in the conversation that the, that the men have with one another as they have the conversation with the women, right? So sometimes we have the djembe, the siembe, the somba, the dundumba, and the kinkini all playing as one, especially in the Guinean culture, very predominant. So I want to talk about some of this amazing, cool writing, that you, calligraphy that you see in the background here. The name of my institute is called the King Sunyata Keita Institute, and we're being housed at a wonderful restaurant in Detroit called Young Village. Right? Shout out to Young Village, Godwin, all the phenomenal cooks and associates of this wonderful business. I'm very fortunate to be here during COVID to promote African drumming culture and um, share some things wonderful about this instrument. So my father in the late 70s found a deep, insatiable wanting to know or knowledge of wanting to know the depth of who we are as a people. So my father had quite the spiritual encounter and it led him to go to Africa. In his journey, he had a chance to go to Mali, he had a chance to go to Senegal, he had a chance to go to Nigeria. He had an opportunity to travel and meet our family from abroad. And thus, this gave birth to King Sunyata Keita. 
So during my father's lifetime, as he would go to Africa and learn the culture in the early 70s, and also he learned under the tools of some phenomenal musicians that I have to mention, Baba Olatunji, Baba Chief Bey, uh, More Cham, Papa Laji. There are some people who come to America that my father was their student and also transitioned and being their colleague. But in his endeavors of learning about African drumming and dance, he would go abroad and he would learn this information. So he would learn about traditional drum. He would learn about traditional dance. He would learn about traditional culture. He would learn about traditional religion. He would learn about traditional food. You know, he would go to the continent and bring these things back here and disseminate this information to so many people in the city of Detroit and throughout North America. So uh, I'm very fortunate for my father because his work, even though he has made his transition almost 16 years now, it still lives on. I find about every day I find out something different about his greatness and the great things that he did in his lifetime that I didn't have preview to everything that he did. But he made quite the mark, quite the impact on so many people's lives here in the city and here throughout the country, here throughout the world. Now, my father just happened to be, you know, quite the percussionist, too. Um, in his lifetime, I had the pleasure to even be in the midst while he played with Carlos Santana, played with the Grateful Dead, played. Well, I didn't get a chance to see Bob Marley because I wasn't alive yet. But uh, <laughs> like, he did play with Bob Marley. Uh, uh, he, I got a chance to play with the Whalers, right? Bob Marley and the Whalers, Junior Marvin and the Whalers. Um, my father got a chance to play with Dizzy Gillespie, Stevie Wonder. I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, my father literally played with some of the greats who changed music as a whole. And he played the djembe way back when, like in the 80s, when the djembe wasn't even a popular instrument yet, but was gaining momentum, you know, and one was one of the four, was one of the teachers of the djembe in the late 80s, in the early 90s, in the early 2000s as well. He was one of the, part, one of the people who definitely perpetuated and pushed the culture for djembe, for dundu, for samba, for kinkini, also for traditional African religion, for ifa, um, for traditional clothing, wore it all the time, hairdress, he had long lots. I mean, he was the epitome of the culture and uh, he did some phenomenal things with the culture here in the city. So we are very grateful for him, for his work. And that gave birth to the King Sagana Keita Institute. So it's been 16 years since he's made his transition. And as his son, I have carried on his work. So um, in my father's footsteps, I had the opportunity to play with some of the greats myself. I had the opportunity to play with Stevie Wonder and John Legend. Um, I got a chance to open up for Lauren Hill. Uh, I got a chance to play in the Super Bowl. Uh, man, there's a lot of gigs that I'm thinking about right now on videotape that I've done, but I've had, in, in walking in my father's footsteps, like I've had the opportunity to pursue and do so many things with the djembe and just following his legacy. And um, around like 2010, 2011, I had this really deep insatiable desire as I climbed to the top and had the opportunity to play with a lot of amazing people, a lot of amazing artists, I had this deep, desire to come back home and teach children. And I can definitely say as much as my father was out here touring and playing with all these mainstream artists and he was doing what we call Kazi, you know, like the work in the community. My father could be on st stage with all the greats, but my father came to my school and played djembe for free, taught a free drum class, you know, taught a free dance class, my mom as well, you know. Um, and they made sure that although that they were artists, that they gave back and gave energy to their community. And um, I had the deepest desire to do so a little bit after 2010. And so I spent easily 2010 all the way to 2020, like 10 years working at a phenomenal institute called Akibalan Village, another amazing institute called um, Timbuktu Academy, also known as Barack, Barack Obama Leadership Academy, um, Daisha Shule. Insta Roman Institute. There are so many Afrocentric schools um, that were here in the city that I had the opportunity to teach at. And I really took to heart the work that my father did in the community because as I, grow old, as I grew older and got more deep into the knowledge of the djembe and the wisdom that it gives and the foundation that it gives for people's um, character and gives for their uh, well-being as a whole, I started to learn that the djembe could be so helpful to so many people.
Um, so as a person who plays the instrument, I've learned some basic things like bass, tone, and slap. I learned some things like the break. These are things that we learn at the Institute. I learned some things like uh, the rhythm that we're learning, cuckoo. Um, I've learned some, some of the, the preliminary things that you learn about djembe, but as far as maybe some of the, the psychology of playing the, the djembe and some of the things that you learn about yourself and you learn about other people, I definitely can say in the time that I taught at these different schools that the drum has had an impact on students. It's had an impact on parents. Um, it's had an impact on people that who have encountered me and I didn't always understand it, but like now as I've gotten a little bit older, I really started to understand if I taught to parents, as I've taught to children who, are, who I started with, they were like eight, but now they're like 16. And they reach out to me and they share with me, you know, that during the time that they gave me a hard time in class every after school, you know, that really and genuinely that they really love class and that it really, really helped them. And they really appreciate the information that I was trying to impart on their lives at the time. I get it all the time. You know, and I really appreciate that even if it took the seed that I planted in their mind via the drum took eight years to blossom, I really appreciate some of the compliments that I've received from parents, that I've received from students, some of the memories that I share at teaching at Akibalon for a decade and some of the performances that we went and did. Like when we were first starting, I had kids that were like five and six and like 10 years later, 14 and 15, they're blossoming to beautiful drummers. You know, um, I had the opportunity to play for a lot of amazing people here in the city. And I'm like really grateful that I've been able to give back in that way because it was very, very beneficial, very refreshing for my soul. Um, so that's why I'm doing this interview because I'm a DSA alumni, you know, <laughs> finding a way to give back. I graduated in 2002, it was many moons ago, you know, but just to give back is, is a beautiful thing because if you play this instrument, um, and you and you deep into the cosmology of the instrument, you're going to want to give back because it gives so much to you. I got some things I want to share with you about the instrument and how it's played, right? So for djembe, some of the most important things you, you should know is the melodic notes. So we have some different exercises that can help create those notes. So a lot of times I rub my hands like such, get the blood circulating, and I stretch out my hands to be in this way and then I bend my hands, I open my fingers, I place them on the drum, and um, I get into the notes that are played. So we have quite a few notes for djembe, but the most popular are bass, tone, and slap. So I'll demonstrate. So we got bass, we have tone, and we have slap. Now, bass, tone, and slap are the melodic notes. Sometimes we refer to them, um, in English we say bass, tone, and slap, but a lot of times maybe we use like Senegalese, we might say tigi, taga, tugu, which is still bass, tone, slap. It's also an easier way to kind of explain the language as we get deep into how the rhythm is played. So we have tigi, taga, tugu, or we have bass, tone, slap. And so a lot of times after we learn the preliminaries of playing bass, tone, slap, we transition to what we call the break. So probably one of the most popular breaks on the planet sounds like this. If you hear that break, that means that we're getting ready to start a rhythm, all right? Um, sometimes if you hear that break, that means that we're playing a transition for a dancer to change movement. Maybe if you hear it again, sometimes it's the outro for the end of a rhythm. So it has many meanings, but more so it communicates that we're getting ready to start or getting ready to end something, right? So I'll give you an example. So we have bass on slap, right? Bass on slap, slap tone bass. Right? You can have a, a conglomerate of many of them, um, but once you understand how to play those notes, we would play the break. So for example, right, that would be our cue. Now let's just take a rhythm uh, from Guinea named Cuckoo. Right? We're kind of learning, well I shouldn't say kind of, we're actually learning this right now at the restaurant. Uh, these are some of the parts that we're learning for Doon Doon right now. And then we got different parts for djembe. But since I'm on the djembe, I'll play some parts for djembe, right? So, for example, break number one. All right, from there we would go into part one. All right, so that could be part one. We could play part two for, uh, a compliment or lead djembe, right? 
I would play the break again, it would sound like this. All right, so and then maybe even the third part, because you can have multiple people playing. So you can have anywhere from six people playing different djembe parts, as well as do new parts as well. So I could play another break and it would sound like. So those are just three basic parts for Cuckoo that we could use. And usually, all three of those parts are played by three individual people playing all at the same time. Not to mention that these are being played with bells too, right? Sometimes they play like upright or what we call ballet style. Um, but also a lot of times they play like village style where we have like the hamana bells that are played with them and each specific part is being played to accompaniment one another. Um, so there are a variety of ways that we learn. Like technically right now we're learning cuckoo. So we got um, Matter of fact, I'm gonna do like a little, little Sawande special here. <laughs> Shouts out to DSA, man. You guys made me really create a person. Uh, so I'm just going to attempt to play like one of the Dunu parts and the djembe part at the same time, just to, so you could kind of hear like what that would sound like. So you would hear the break. It would sound something like this. From there. That's my one hand break, by the way. So it would be like. <laughs> All right. Once that's played. Okay, now that's one variation. Another variation could be easy, like. All right. Now, uh, kinkinny could be like. And don't know about could be like, wow, those parts are being played, right? Um, other there are other varieties too, but those are those are like some basic concepts that could be used while playing. So normally we don't do this, but this is just to kind of show um, how they can sound together if if we have both people. <laughs> we we got myself, so I'm gonna do my best to, to translate how that sounds. So we will play the break. Okay, so that's my shouts out to DSA, okay? DSA made me definitely think about how to do really creative things with drumming. Listen to all your teachers at DSA, okay? They know what they're talking about. <laughs> all right, uh, but that's just kind of like um, how, keep in mind that two people will be playing this, but for the sake of the video, I'm playing both parts at the same time. Um, two people will be playing this, these individual parts for Cuckoo. Uh, so those are some of the things, like that's the rhythm that we're learning right now at the King's Gun to Institute right now at Young Village. That's one of the first rhythms we're working on. And uh, that's my spiel on how to play the drums and what they mean. So I got some uh, cool things I wanna share with y'all about West African music and hip hop and some of the correlations and connections musically. So I like to think that a lot of times when we listen to our contemporary hip hop, uh, I grew up in the Tupac and Biggie era, so that was like a little while ago. Um, but I know we transitioned into the trap era, right? Um, and so just looking at one genre of, one generation of hip hop to another, although we have a golden era 
in everyone's era, everybody has their own golden era, by the way. <laughs> everybody has theirs. Um, looking at, like, I want to say early 70s, when I think about hip-hop, I kind of think about the last poets. Um, people like that gave birth to the sensation that we would later call hip-hop and then what we would also call rap, right? So I'll just say from the early 70s, the, the last poets, and go straight to, like, 2021, which would be trap music, our contemporaries, you know, our Cardi B's, our Drake's, and so forth. Um, the one correlation that I noticed as a person that plays African rhythms, I like to think that when we listen to the beat, this is the most instinctual and probably the most, uh, what's the word? Uh, it's, it's, it's probably the most infectious part of the music, right? That we really listen to that gets us amped, that gets us, you know, there's so many anthems out here now. This is kind of like the anthem era where like I, <laughs> it's different, hip hop is different, you know, rap is different. A lot of the trap music that I listen to, the, the, the beats per minute is a lot slower and it has more of an anthem, like drive type of feel to it, right? Whereas the music that I listened to in the 90s, uh, the beats per minute was a little bit faster and the beats were a little bit more melodic than what we hear today. It's a little different. Um, but nonetheless, even with those subtle differences, what I hear a lot in um, hip hop rhythms, uh, hip hop beats, whether it be today or past, there is a deep correlation between hip hop and African rhythms. It's so deep. Um, one I'll talk about that, that I know, um, let's use our brother Drake for example. Drake uses a lot of what we call clave in Afro-Cuban music, right? We have 2-3 clave, we have 3-2 uh, clave. That rhythm, in, in Cuban music we use, and I'll, and I'll give you a demonstration. That's three two clave. But sometimes if we if we play djembe, we might call that funga, for example. Okay, so that's that's more of like the the ancient version, if you will. But just coming back uh, to modern music, uh, let me see. Chris Brown uses it too a lot too in his music. A lot of the producers use it. Um, the funga or the 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 three two clave is in a lot of hip hop beats. My goodness, key key, do you love me? Definitely in there. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, let me see. These young ladies are not loyal. Um, <laughs> straight in there. I had to, I, we had to pull up the song, and I would. I would uh, literally give you the funga or the two, I'm sorry, the three, two clave, and you would find. All right, so like just trapping it out a little bit, just a little bit. You guys got that, that interesting hi-hat sound, like off, off beat hi-hat. <laughs> no, yeah, my bad. Uh, I like the offbeat hi hat. I'm not a hater, by the way. I, it's just it's just an interesting. I'm just used to hearing regular coda notes, you know, as opposed to like sticks falling and stuff. So anyhow, uh, I'll just do like what I what I hear in music now sounds something like this. Right, so like sometimes, you know, shout out to the '80s, the Scratchers with a man, so such an '80s person, such a you know, man, goodness. Uh, let me not go too far back in hip hop, but nonetheless, uh, that's what I hear now, right? That's more of the the sound now. So for a person that plays African rhythms, that listens to contemporary music, right? I hear these ancient rhythms that are coming out of our modern day producers' uh, beat machines easily out of the, and, and our, our today's current artists are using, whether they know about them or not, some of them may be knowledgeable, some of them may not be, um, but these sounds belong to Africa, 
right? They belong to African traditions. Like, and I'll give you an example. Fungus sounds like. All right, now that's super old. First beats I ever learned. <laughs> Shout out to dad, man. That was one of the first beats I ever learned and really, really liked. So. It's played on top. Now that would have been our, you know, Funga is a very, very old dance. It's the welcome dance that comes out of Sierra Leone, but brought to us by Pearl Primus way back when. That's a, that's a whole history lesson in itself. But knowing that those rhythms were coming out of Sierra Leone uh, I also know that Funga comes out of Guinea too. A little different, but they, they have different version. Some of these African rhythms that we instinctually think that are just rhythms, they're in your hip hop songs. They are, they are there. I'm a person that plays African rhythms and I catch them. Uh, one of my favorite, um, there's a rhythm called Dansa or Jansa, right? It goes. So Jansa is like uh, super duper hip hop. The last time that I remember hearing it, and this is like Busta Rhymes, I think I remember hearing uh, Chris Brown saying, look at me now, right? This is a little while ago. I think this is like four or five, maybe longer than that, maybe seven or eight years ago. But if you slow down the track, it's like, look at me now, L look at me now. Okay, I can't probably rap and say that at the same time. But <laughs> All right, I know they're going to try. Okay, I'm going to stay in my lane. But if you listen to the beat, man, if you go on YouTube and pull it up and just listen to the instrumental track, you'll hear. All right, you will hear that. Also, you will definitely hear your kinkiny, your samba parts. You always hear what you call your 808s now, really strong, you know, uh, your mid-range sound um, in between bass, and then what we would call kinkiny, your high note sound, right? Those sounds are deeply, deeply woven into your hip hop. I can't even, especially your trap music, super low end, super duper low end. There's nothing that you don't hear that doesn't sound like That's kind of like the Jeezy era, but like, you know, <laughs> shout out to young Jeezy. Like, you definitely hear those type of sounds. Um, and I, I've heard a lot of clave come out of that. But then sometimes you have a more popular one, like, uh, this is like the 90s. So like those, that beat, like that's the one I grew up. That's, that's like the Tupac and Biggie era for me. Like everything sounded like that, right? Now in my research and playing some other drums that come out of uh, West Africa, true story, I was like learning from another great master. He plays the instrument called the bata, right? And you have the konkolo, the totale. Um, we have different drums that, that they use. They play them this way. Uh, anyhow, make a long story short, this same beat. Was like literally inside of the rhythm that I was learning that we call Cho C, right, for the Arisha. Like, I was, and I was like blown away that um, some of the same parts that have transitioned like in history, like uh, musical African drum history in antiquity, like I'm not talking like right now, I'm talking about like if we could imagine um, whatever we think is hip hop in terms of beats, 
where is the origin and where did they come from? Like, is it possible that these rhythms have a root that is far extended past today's modern artists? Um, and then, you know, it's also in, like, the drum is in us. And so, like, while it's, while some of these rhythms may predate some of our contemporaries knowing about the science of these rhythms, they're rooted in so many African rhythms. The ones that I just happen to notice is clave, right? And then the other one that I know, I, I've just played for you. Real popular, you know, so shouts out to hip hop, you know, shouts out to um, rap music, you know, different cultures, but nonetheless, uh, similarities. Shouts out to the drum and people who play the instrument, right? Because shout out to the DJ, man. Just If we just talking about the DJ, you know, the acronym for the DJ is D and J. But like in traditional like Malinke culture or Senegalese culture, we have what we call Joliba. Uh, we use the term griot sometimes, but the Joliba, and ironically, just making you know small comparison, Joliba and DJ just happen to be the words that started off. Even Jimbe, DJ, right? <laughs> like, I'm going somewhere with it. But like the DJ inside of Jimbe, the one similarity, or there are many, but even another, each rhythm that I teach people, whether it's Kuku, Manjani, Lamba, Sunu, each rhythm have a meaning and have a reason why we play it. That rhythm documents history. If we think about music that we like, that we love, we listen to what we call records, right? They record, and if you think about certain music and certain things you were thinking about, a lot of times they would denote a specific time or history in your life. But they call it a record because it really does document history, right? So the if if we're just looking at music, then now we're if we're looking at music and then we're looking at the drum, like the drum is 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 the Inside of every genre of music, every classical form of music, and there are so many, the beat is probably the first thing that we listen to, whether it was classical, whether it was hip hop, whether it was jazz, whether it was soul, whether it was funk, whether it was techno. Like, at the end of the day, the patterns that give birth to, uh, the, the, um, the rhythms that give birth to the patterns are still very rhythmic, even if they have notes. You know, you can take the notes away, and um, you have music. You know, so, um, or you have drum patterns. So, yeah, I hope that some of the beats that I share with you, I hope y'all get a chance to go ahead and listen to them, YouTube them. Uh, even put in some of the rhythms I said, like Jansa. You know, you will find these rhythms, you know. I can, uh, I play some of them for you, but these rhythms are deeply interwoven in hip-hop. So, shouts out to hip hop and shouts out to African Drum. Peace. All right, thank you so much, Sawande, for sharing all that. There's a ton of information. Yeah, we got just short videos going on. I was curious, though, does anyone have any questions for Sawande? I think he's here in, uh, in our meeting. So anything that you'd want to ask, anything that got brought up during the video, you can put it in the chat, or you can um, unmute yourself. Okay, while well, everyone's thinking of questions, um, Swande, are you there? Can you hear me? Let's see. Let's give it a second. Hey, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, cool. Good to hear you. Um, great, great. I had a question to start us off. Um, where can students hear like more of your music, more West African music, or where can these students participate in it in the city? Uh, definitely. Um, so, here, can you hear me? Can you see me? Is that? I'm trying to put the video on too. By the way, let me see. I think I may be. Oh, boom! Here it goes. Oh, here we go. I'm here. Hey, good day, everyone. Hey, what's up? Um, good day, students. Um, so if you'd like to hear more West African music, I'm definitely working on my album, but there I can give you some great, wonderful uh, African artists to follow. 
I'm sure we were in the modern era of, of streaming. So yeah, Spotify and uh, different uh, platforms. So Mama Di Keita is a good one. Uh, Fabanu, Famadu Kunate is another great djembe artist, um, two of the grand masters of the drum that we can listen to. Um, also Salif Keita, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, those are those are some primary West African artists that are really, really good. Uh, I know a lot, a lot of times we have um, even the Afrobeat artists too are very good to listen to because they're more of a contemporary style where our music is in terms of what um, young people are listening to. Um, so some of the genres that I just mentioned are like um, people who play more of the ancient music, right? That they have been preservers. Uh, so Mamadi, Famadou, Salaf Keita. Uh, let me see. Those are the first, the first three I can think of that are they're really amazing. From there, like Yusuf Ndor, you know, there there'd be a plethora of people who are West African music. Uh, Baba Latunji. I'm thinking about them. They kind of slowly hit my mind. Um, I'm sure if you go on Spotify and you put a few names like that, a, a whole conglomerate of people <laughs> are going to pop up. Yeah, it'll be a lot to choose from. But you know, sometimes it's cool to pick pick a country. Um, I listen to a lot of Senegalese music. I listen to a lot of mini Malian music. I listen to like a lot of Guinean music. I listen to a lot of music from Sierra Leone. I even I even listen to their their hip hop. Um, a lot of times it's in a different language, like their native tongue or French. Um, so even though I don't always understand everything that's being said, you know, about my head I listen. You know, more or less how I would listen to uh, our contemporary music here in Detroit. You know, our radio. Cool. Uh, where can students participate? Where can they like learn to play from you or from other people in the city? Uh, great question, great question. So Young Village is definitely a space uh, incubator for that. Um, I'm gonna start a, I think maybe the age group in high school kind of be remember like 13 to like 18, something like that. Uh, I, I probably need to create a class for that age group. Uh, so Young Village eventually will definitely open up the space we're just kind of like coordinated time and place it's a pretty busy place right it's a restaurant uh, <laughs> and it's just interesting to have African drum at the restaurant at the restaurant I know a lot of people are like wow didn't know that I was gonna hear some beats and eat some food you know um <laughs> but uh if they would like to learn djembe you know I do private lessons um follow me on Instagram or Facebook also I definitely will be I'm glad we're having this conversation because I definitely will open up a class for like that age. Um, so yeah, Young Village will probably be the space as as uh, as uh, the days progress. I'm gonna dip into the chat because there's a couple questions and comments in here. Makaya Samuel says, I like how you talked about African music and the hip hop rap music history uh, connection today. And uh, Caleb wants to know, um, the style that inspired Chris Brown's song, Look At Me Now. Oh man, great question. Where is the speaker when you need it? Uh, <laughs> when I mean speaker, I mean my, uh, my, my little speaker. Because I'm on my phone, I can't actually play the song right now, but you know, I'm pretty sure they can listen to it. Can you model um, the drum beat again? Sure. Uh, doom, doom, mm, mm, mm. Mm, 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 mm. Look at me now. Okay, I'm gonna start there because I'm not a rapper. I'm gonna stay in my lane. But uh, <laughs> that uh, I remember um, actually doing a presentation um, at Wayne State University where I where I visited a lot of these same topics about five or six years ago, and um, I was like listening more to traditional. African music at the time. So I wasn't listening to rap so much, um, but I'm still a Chris Brown friend. I had friends that dance with him. You know, some of them are Detroit artists. I, actually, a lot of them are. Um, but I, I was like, just, you know, a person who listens to music and and heard it and was like, wow, this is Malian music. Like dansa or dansa. And that rhythm is shared in three countries. Some Inglese people play it. Uh, Guinean people play it. Um, Malian people play it, but when you know about the origins of where rhythms come, just playing the djembe specifically, we always get credit to Mali first because Mali is the country that gave birth to the djembe. Um, and so it would be a shared instrument amongst five other countries. 
But like John Sir, like it's real, like um, I, I would call it like jazzy, but it can be considered jazzy. But if we, you know, I look at jazz or I look at hip hop as like the modern day jazz, if you will, for young people. So it could it could fold over right into what we call what we could call jazz. It could be very very much hip hop easily. And so like that rhythm in particular is in a lot of other, like that variant rhythm, because there are different versions of Johnson, right? Um, but that pattern, doom, 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 is a very, very ancient pattern. Like Johnson has been played at least 2000 years plus, right? So I'm glad that our brother Chris Brown and whatever producer sat down to create that amazing rhythm, that whether they knew about, um, whether they knew about that rhythm, uh, like in the way that I knew about it, or if they just felt it in their soul and they felt like, yeah, this is the beat. This, this is the one that had to be on the, when it got on the NBC, like, yeah, this is the one, this is the one. You know, uh, I'm, I'm glad that, that, that whether we knew about it or not, like it's root, that, that, that it's still out there. Like it's still like permeating, um, even though it's a very ancient rhythm, you know, maybe it, it was on somebody's beat machine, you know, maybe, maybe the producer who felt it, felt it internally and, you, you never know, like sometimes we feel rhythms and I've experienced it. Sometimes people, I've, I've had people come to my class, they said they feel rhythms so deeply when they hear them, like they inspire them or, or they, they feel a certain way afterwards. And I say a lot of times those rhythms speak to you. And a lot of times um, the rhythms that you hear could be associated with the family that you were born into, right? When you talk to people who are very really deeply woven into the culture of how these rhythms came about, I'm one of those people. So sidebar, just give you an example. Um, I, met a, I met a young man, this relates to singers. So this is kind of like music too. I met a Senegalese uh, carver that makes djembe's and I wanted to buy some from him. And his English is pretty good. My Wolof, his language is not so good, but just good enough for us to have a conversation. My French was decent enough for us to have a conversation. Come to find out he speaks English very good. And we were talking and he said to me, he said, do you sing? And he asked me, I said, I sing a little bit. By the way, I went to DSA for singing. Shouts out to Miss Valentine. Uh, <laughs> she's still there, right? Shouts out to Miss Valentine. She's the reason that I got into uh, vocal music. She's the reason I got into DSA, respectfully, Mr. Quick. Um, but yeah, she's still there. Yeah, shout out to Miss Valentine. I got to tell her the story. But again, the gentleman asked me, he said, he said, your face looks like Ndungalo. And I was like, wow. I said, what's Ndungalo, bro? He said, because I know Ndungalo is a drum and, and, and like the Eastern coach in um, East Africa, or I should say Central Africa, actually, right? In the Congo, they play instruments like the Ndungalo, right? So it's like more of a Congolese instrument. But it just so happened that although the, the Ndungalo is a drum, it also has to be, it happens to be a group of people that stay in like Senegal or Gambia area. And he said, Ndungalo people are some of the best singers. And I said, how do you know that? He said, your face. He said, your face is Ndungalo. And I was like, wow, like I was just totally blown away. Here it is. I know some things about African culture because I've had three weeks to study and learn some things via my family and go abroad. And, but I, you know, I didn't know that. And I was like, in Dungalo, how about that? So this explains my, my desire to want to sing. Now, I'm pretty sure that in Dungalo people probably have instruments, probably have drums that support their culture, to support these ideals, right? And they most likely probably have rhythms like some of the ones that we may be listening today in our contemporary music, right? That, uh, uh, that whether we know it or not, it's still like interwoven into who we are, right? So that was a cool history lesson. And ever since then, I've been in contact with that gentleman, that gentleman to just ask him questions, you know? <laughs> you know, cause he's like a teacher away from home. You know, I can ask him things about the djembe. I don't carve drums. I actually repair them and I string them up, but I don't, I don't make them from scratch. So he has a press of information about um, the, uh, the science of how the drum is made, it being in nature, like the, the type of life it lives before it becomes a drum. All of that is, is, a, is a very, uh, is all important in being able to play the instrument, right? Uh, so yeah, sidebar, that was my little spill on singing and drumming. And, uh, and again, like how these things are interwoven. So shouts out to our brother, Chris Brown, man. He makes a lot of amazing music. Uh, if we just talking about Chris Brown, he did another song uh, called These Girls Ain't Loyal. And that's where I noticed Fonga even more, right? Um, and I was like, wow. I mean, he, there was no, it, he, they literally just played boom, boom. I'm sorry. Uh, um, boom, boom, boom. 
boom, 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 and I was like, wait a minute. Okay, that bass line is dope, but that drum, that is funga, man. Like, that is undeniably funga. My Cuban brothers would call that clave, you know, but again, these things come out of Africa. This is shared experience. The clave, whether we call it clave or whether we call it funga, and there could be more names than the one that I'm sharing because Africa is a very huge continent. I don't like to think that West Africa just plays that one beat. There are 55 countries in Africa. I, I would guess that all 55 may play this beat in their own unique way. But it was just interesting to hear, um, again, some of the producers and maybe the people who get together to create these rhythms when they make these songs. These African rhythms could be in their mind, could be in their heart, could be in their beat machine, and it comes out in their mind that music. So a person like me who plays ancient music, I pick up on it like immediately. And I think it's really interesting to hear. That's awesome. Um, yeah. On video, uh, I think he has a question. And then we got another question Please. in chat. Please hit me, hit me. What's up, John? Oops. Oh. Sorry. Hey, yeah, I couldn't unmute myself for some reason. Um, no problem, sir. First of all, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be um, on this call with you. Of course, I wish we were in person. Um, Likewise. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm Jerron. I'm a junior at DSA, trumpet player. And um, so I, 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 I wanted to, I had, like, I had a couple questions, actually. So um, please. first, uh, I wanted to know if you had any experience in particular playing um, with jazz musicians and maybe uh, if you've, you know, taken on any advice from them, um, you know, on what to do in your career, um, you know, branching out in different other genres, and, um, you know, really what it's been like to, um, you know, have been an alumni, um, you know, from DSA, and then, you know, uh, expanding your career out from Detroit. So that was oh, a question. Man, those are three wonderful questions. Uh... Great question, man. Thank you, man. Um, shouts out to juniors. Woo, y'all was out there. <laughs> I'm ready to go, trust There. Woo, during COVID, it's amazing, man. Um, so let me answer your first question. Ask that question again, because I want to answer all three. Well, let me answer your first question about jazz musicians. Um, so the, um, I was in jazz band. I had Mr. Quick and I had Mr. Nashif. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure they're not there anymore. I went to the old DSA, like on. Uh, they have okay. My our DSA isn't even there anymore. Okay, so that, <laughs> so I went there, but I could tell you, um, at the time when I was in jazz band, there were a few. Uh, um, there were definitely a few great jazz greats who came to the school. Marcus Belgrave is one of them, right? Shouts out to Marcus E by A. You know that means I pay homage to. Uh, he definitely imparted some amazing wisdom to the students. Um, as a drummer, one thing that he shared with me is to learn, like a, a, a young man like yourself who plays trumpet, is to learn how to compliment you as opposed to being like too busy, you know, um, or just knowing when to play things and when not to, right? Like the cliffs and the valleys of like, cause jazz can get, you know, so like we can go all the way out there musically, but um, just being able to feel that you know, have being empathetic enough to feel when um, he was more of a uh, he's more of a stickler on, on things being like played straight, but leaving room for creativity. So I appreciate uh, uh, Mr. Belgrave for sharing that, and I appreciate him teaching so many young people, man. So many of us. Uh, so yeah, I, I try my best, like as a as a musician or as a drummer, um, a lot of times to play music that, again, complements the, the trumpeter. Because a lot of times, like if the trumpeter is out front, you're like the leader of the sound. A lot of times you're, you're more the dominant force, whereas the drums may be more of the supportive force. And it could be like a, I like to call it like Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen type role, where one is the dominant leader and one is the follower. And then at any given moment, it can switch, you know? Um, so I think that's a good mindset to have for anything in life, but if, if it's music, you know, to be able to share the spotlight is an amazing thing. And to be able to like blend and listen to other people who have their own voice and have something else amazing to say, even if you're the leader of them as a the trumpeter, right? That you can like coexist with them and make amazing music. You know, I learned some of those. I learned some of those things in marching band. Sorry, this little thing keep popping up. I'm sorry. Uh, 
I learned some of those amazing things in marching band under the direction of Mr. Quick. Uh, I learned some of those things and um, jazz band as well. And then like, as I stepped outside of the door, uh, my father was a heavy jazz cat. So um, I got a chance to hit with Wim Marcellus a few times. I met him. Yeah, I, matter of fact, man, hold on, two seconds. Stay right there, I'm gonna show y'all something. Uh, hold on, two seconds. Okay, um, I don't know if y'all can see this. This is just my little photo album. Oops, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> about to knock my whole camera on, over. So um, this is a picture of me. I, I don't know if you can see that, it's kind of like in the camera, but that's a picture of my father and me and Winton. Um, my father, so Winton has some real strong connections. I'm sure you know Winton Marcellus. You know, Winton got some real strong Detroit connections, real strong. Like um, a, lot of, a lot of our prominent drummers and, and musicians, um, that are deeply interwoven in jazz, definitely have a strong Detroit connection. Um, what I learned from when is how cool him and my father was. I didn't know that. You know, I looked through the photo album and started, like, this was more of a, a picture that was taken, like, maybe, I don't know, that might have been, like, 15 years ago. You know, but um, I would find out, like, as I looked through my father's photo album, it's a whole bunch of pictures of him and when. Now, going over a little bit more, that's a picture of me and Marcus Belgraves. Right, same gentleman I was just talking about. Let me see if that's, uh, you can see that one. Um, that was just a couple of years later. Um, this was at the same year, this was at Detroit uh, Symphony Orchestra. That's me and Hurl and Riley and my father. Um, so I'm sure you know who Hurl and Riley is, you're a jazz cat, I'm sure you know. You know, these are, these are people who have a very, very strong Detroit connection. I mean, super duper strong. Um, so I, I've learned some amazing things from them and, and very honored that I've had the opportunity to even know them or, or because my father was their uh, colleague musically, that I had to be in a position, you know, just be around them and listen to them. I got a chance to play with them at Burks just a long time ago, like many months ago. Um, but even then, some of that same wisdom that, that Marcus gave us, Winton insisted that the music be straight, like um, play the music as the way that it was written and then leave a little bit more space for like improv and like other cool stuff. So, uh, good question, man. You just made me think about these pictures, bro. I see these pictures every day and walk past. I'm literally thinking about them all the time. You know, it was this, these were pictures that I cherished because um, my father is no longer here. Um, Mr. Bill Grace is no longer here. You know, so these pictures are, uh, right, I hold very dear. They're some of the first pictures you see when you walk into my home. You know, so shouts out to them, man. May they rest in power. We have one last question in the chat and um, before we leave today, and it's from Marie sure. Nelson, who is also a DSA percussionist. She yeah. says, uh, moving forward in your career, what do you plan on doing and what do you, I'm sorry, and what impact do you want it to make on the community? Oh, great question, great question. So um, right now I'm at my home called the Jimbe House. Uh, it was inspired by a young lady who started a home called the Homework House. That's a long story. But she does phenomenal work in this city. Her name is Mama Shu, right? She does amazing work 10 years ago. Um, something very devastating, I won't tell the story because it's real long. Something very devastating happened to her, but she turned that negative situation into a positive situation. And everyone told her, um, hold on, somebody's calling me. All right, decline. Somebody just called me. Somebody just called me, decline, decline. Uh, ever since she, yes, Alvalon Village, yes. Shouts out to Mama Shu. Ever since uh, what happened to her, it was so overwhelming. She took that and made that a very positive thing. I've always been inspired by that. So I started what we call the Jimmy House and I started my nonprofit called the Kingston Yellow K2 Institute. So what I hope to tell my, my um, two family flat into in our neighborhood is a very safe space for our community. One of the, one of the things that we'll do here primarily um, is that I'll be teaching African drum prior in my attic. So there's a little remodeling going on. Like we're like, tearing the house up, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's pretty functional in here, but it's the stuff that's kind of tore up, you know, as I'm starting to build momentum and uh, pulling a lot of my own money is really getting ready to raise money so that people who come to the Djembe house, they can learn some African rhythms, they can learn some African dance, but ultimately it'd be a safe space for people to be in, um, in our community. And I hope to create more houses like Mama Shu. Uh, I, I kid you not, I love her work. I was uh, an employee at the school. This lady used to write my check. And she just doesn't know what well, she knows. I've shared this affectionately how much I love what she does. But again, she's a huge inspiration and we wanted to start the Jimbe House. So I hope as a nonprofit that we can really start to change a lot of the things that we see wrong in our and just in our immediate com community. 
even if it's as, as simple as picking up the trash and the kids that show how to drum are drumming for that, you know, it can be it can be the very small things that I'm really I'm looking to attack that are very significant and very systemic in our community. So that's that's one of my endeavors in, in dealing with like the, the part of me that's the humanitarian. Um, the part of me that's a musician wants to play with everybody famous that you love. All right. I want to make beats and play with any and everybody just about because I love music, you know. So um, yeah, that's my spiel. Thanks. Great question. Thanks for asking me. Thank you so much, Sawande, for joining us today. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up, but oh. we're gonna be back. We're gonna be back next Friday, same cool. Zoom link, um, 11 a.m. Okay. And we have some more video and some more collaborations to show you guys. We did a huge video shoot on Saturday and we have mm. some really, really awesome stuff to show you next week. So invite your friends. Sure. A round of applause for Sawande. Thank you for all your hard work and joining us today and answering our questions. Our pleasure. Round of applause for DSA. Shouts out to you. So y'all for videotaping, you know, thanks for videotaping. I got a chance to look at myself. And a recording visual, I haven't seen myself in a visual like that ever. I'm, I have a lot of things to work on, you know, so, but thank y'all for the opportunity and I look forward to this week. If y'all want to follow me though, uh, y'all can follow me on Instagram. You know, uh, if there are any more questions, you know, I love to answer questions for uh, you up and coming musicians. You DSA people, man, keep at it, man. I got a friend named Thaddeus Ditson. Um, he's a drummer when we were O2s. He is such an inspiration. This guy is producing so many, man, like so many, he is producing so many hits for people. He reached out to me recently. And um, yeah, like he, him and so many other people, like, so yeah, he's killing, yeah, he's amazing. I say that to say like, you know, people like him and like you young people are the next wave of people who are gonna come out of DSA to do more phenomenal things, I know this. So, you know, stay focused. I know COVID has definitely shifted our consciousness in terms of things that are happening, but um, decline, decline. Somebody try to call me again. Somebody try to call me again, decline, decline. Sorry, but yes, y'all stay focused, man. Y'all gonna do amazing things. Shout outs to all freshmen, seniors, sophomores, uh, juniors, Teachers, you know, y'all keep doing that thing. I love what y'all doing. Peace and love. Thanks, Sawande. Yeah. 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 You can follow me at Sawande Keita 2313 on Instagram. It's basically my first and last name. So uh, it's S O W A N D E K E I T A 2313. Um, yeah. So that's my most popular Instagram page. I got a few other pages. I'm a gardener. So, um, when you go on my first page, you kind of see some of the other pages that I do, my nonprofit and things like that, of that nature. Thank you so much. And you can also follow Detroit Grooves on Instagram at yep. Detroit underscore Grooves. And that's where you're going to find awesome photos and video clips from the series. Shout outs. Thank you. Yeah, have a blessed day, man. Happy Friday. Woo! Happy Friday. Yeah, so warm in Detroit. Yeah. All right. I look forward to this week. Look forward to next week. See ya. See ya. Peace.